and welcome to today's free training Thursday. I have Sam Saab here with me today and he will be taking us through using the configurations options module. If you have any questions, please put them in the sidebar and we will get to them at the end. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sam and he, he'll take us through his presentation. Amanda, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being on today's call. Uh, let me please confirm that you're able to see my screen, Amanda. That would be showing the title. Yes, confirm. Okay, awesome. All right, so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the shipping version of results, which currently is results um, uh, version 18. And I'm going to go ahead and jump to that right now and get started with the training. So, this will be the version we're going to use. Um, please confirm login screen this slide, Amanda. Confirm. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so we're going to come into the results version 18. Uh, there's a couple of places for, from which you're going to be able to access the configuration options screen. The configuration options screen is available to you from the home menu, and that's available right there, configuration options. We also, for convenience sake, we make it available to you in multiple other locations. In case you were not on the home menu, but you were on the tools or setup menu, it is the same module we're just making the button to access it available in multiple locations to simplify uh, how you get to it so uh, let's go ahead and get into that module what we plan today uh, to do today is to basically walk you through every single option and all the uh, in, in this module so here's what we've done because this is a large system that has multiple uh, modules in it the result system what we have done is we've done the configurations broken up by some general categories sometimes, but we also go module level settings. So if you want to set up things for the context module, you would go to context tab, activities, calendar, etc. So we're going to start from general, and these are settings you can have that will affect and impact uh, the full use of the system. Most of those are per user. In other words, if you make a change here on the startup options, you're only impacting the startup options for you as a user under that user ID. In this case, I'm logged in as Mary. Mary is the user ID in, in this system, and so these will only impact Mary's settings. Now, if I'm an administrator, and right now I am, there's a number of things I'll be able to see on the screen that others will not be able to see your regular users will not be able to see. And I'll, I'll touch on those when we get to the screen that has those. <clears throat> but let's go ahead and start with, with general and uh, touch on all the different pieces. So this first one is the uh, a desktop setting. I have that by default that's turned on. Effectively, it says every time you log into the results, results will open up to the full screen, taking full advantage of the size of the screen as compared to start as a sub, you know, uh, open within the larger screen as a window. The next settings up here, there's a number of them. I'm going to go through those. Some of them might get technical, but again, uh, I'll cover them all. By default, we have this box unchecked. And what this is really designed to do is that if you have a lot of data, let's say you have um, 500,000 or a million contact records or above, um, and on the activities, there are a lot of companies that have 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 activities. These are all the records of all the activities in the system. So um, by default right now, whenever you click on manage, if you go to say contacts acti or activities and click manage to go to the DMC, it will automatically pull for you all the records when the data management center opens. What this does is it changes that behavior. It effectively says, I don't need you to show me all the data. Give me an opportunity first because there's so much of that data to come from the server down to my machine. It takes uh, some time for the, for the screen to, to be ready. So instead, we're going to change the behavior. We're going to have the system start up in search mode and pause there, waiting for the user to enter the search information. 
and then they'll be able to proceed to, to click on that. So let me show you the behavior of that. Again, this is typically recommended when you have a lot of records in the system. A lot of records are relevant, right? So if you have a slower network, maybe 5,000 or 10,000 records will be slower than you want it to be. Let me, let me show you the, the uh, end result of that. If you go to context and click on manage, doesn't matter how many records you have, we're going to download everything from the server to the local station. So everything now is loaded. And if you're going to search for anyone with the last name S, for example, you see how quick it is because all the data has been copied locally uh, to fill this grid. Not every single piece of data is brought down to your local machine that will take too long to download, but enough information to fill the data management center. Now, let's see what that behavior looks like if this setting is on. So if I go to options and check this box, let's try the same exact thing now that we have made that change. So contacts are not open, and we go to, say, contacts and manage. What you'll notice here is the system did not even attempt to bring any data from the server. It did not waste time. It went directly to the search. It's going to wait for me to tell it what I'm looking for. Oh, I'm looking for anyone who started with a last name starting with S. I put an S in there, click apply, and now the data came back. So instead of bringing everything down, then filter it to what you need or, you know, set a condition, a filter condition criteria, we've set the condition up front and only requested from the server what we want to see. So it's efficient, it's speedier. Some people are just used to bringing the data down. So by default, we bring the data down for you until you tell us otherwise. Now, this feature, the auto refresh DMC, is only available um, if you do not have this checkbox, uh, the, the third one. By default, this is unchecked. This is an advanced feature. Not everyone can handle it. I'll explain what those two are. But if you're going to take advantage of that feature of allowing multiple data entry screens to be open, then the auto refresh cannot happen. By default, this is unchecked. Auto refresh is checked. This is typically how we ship it. So basically, just to explain what that means is that if you close the screen with the auto refresh on, that basically means if you have data in here, you go to manage, uh, you open up the data itself, and let's say you have this email address for this person. If you open up the record, change the email address to something else, hit save and come back out, it will automatically refresh the information on the grid when you exit from that screen. That's because it's, it's a controlled mechanism, right? So you're going to open up the screen, you make the change, exit, and then the screen will be updated. That's called the auto refresh. So uh, because you didn't have to push the refresh button up here to reload the data, the system automatically updated itself because it knew that you made a change to the screen and you exited the screen. And that's the default behavior. If, on the other hand, you said, you know what, no, I'd rather be able to open up more than one record at the same time. This is like being able to, and I'll show you, this is an extremely powerful, but by default, we do not have it. Because a non-technical uh, person doesn't have to be technical. A person that might not be as comfortable with computers um, would not be, uh, would, might get confused and might wonder what happened to their other record. Here's what we're talking about. With multiple records available to be open at the same time, I am able to open up the record for Stefan Anderson as an example. Let's minimize it a little bit. And now I'm able to notice, I'm able to float my uh, um, cursor up here, and now I can go to projects. While the screen is still open, I'm going to go to projects, manage. And I'm going to go ahead and apply that search. And we're going to go and double click on that one. And you'll notice what's happening right now. I have my project screen and my contact screen open at the same time. I can size them to be half a screen, move this to the other half, and see them side by side. Yes, you can do that in results. You can open up as many screens as you want to and open them at the same time if you want to. But the user that's not sophisticated or not comfortable, as comfortable with computers might find this very confusing because uh, you, uh, it would seem as if their other screen automatically disappeared and it did not. So that's what we're able to do for you up here. All right, let's get back to the configuration options. So this is an option you can turn on. 
And if you turn it on, notice how the auto refresh becomes unavailable. The reason for that is because we're allowing it to open up more than one screen at the same time. We don't know when you're done with that screen, so we don't know when to refresh the DMC. So we can no longer auto refresh it for you. We don't have the ability to do that because of the multiple screens open at the same time. So the next one is by default, especially if you've been on version 17 or version 18 after the, the uh, with the with the Abacus Next uh, version of results, uh, then you're able to by default use our new screens. If you want to use the classic screens or the older screens, you uncheck that. The next thing available to you up here is the ability by default to warn of suspicious dates. So basically, if you try to schedule an activity, and we're in 2018 right now in September, if you try to schedule an activity and you put it more than a year out, um, it will you know it will wonder it will warn you and ask you whether this is intentional or you really doing that. If you're receiving a payment and it's uh, you today, you're saying add a payment and you go to put a payment date that's more than 30 days in the future, we will wonder whether you're really logging the right information because uh, if you're entering the payment today as if it was received today, it should be within a few days from when you put it in the system. So these we call, we call suspicious dates and so we can warn you about them or you can ask us not to do so. When you're exiting results right now, you get prompted in the middle of the screen as to, are you sure you want to exit? Um, and you can turn that off if you want to. The idea there is that if you click this X on the top screen by mistake, it will take you a number of steps to get back into the system. So that would that seemed like too much of a penalty to just potentially click on an X by mistake. So we prompt you to whether you want to exit or not, but you can overwrite that. This is a new one. This is only in version 18. Keep main menu ribbon minimized. Now, when you start getting to results, the results menu, main menu is minimal. And so it doesn't take any screen space and it's hidden, tucked away, and you can always engage it, but it effectively is not available until you get to it. So um, you are able to then, if you want to, if you prefer the old look, uh, you can uncheck that box. It will always open as a full menu. The next one is, uh, is something to do with the efficiency. It um, effectively affects the efficiency by how, my, how fast the screens load and how many records come back from the um, a server down to the results side when you're opening screens that have a grid on the left side. And so I think the default is 1,000, which will stay there. If not, it will be 500. Most of the time, you don't need to mess with that, but you can change it if you want to. This is typically good for screens like this. Uh, on your maintenance screen, for example, you go to, let's say, groups. You see how it's going to load those records for you on the far left-hand side automatically? The 1,000 or whatever the number is will set the max for which that were to be loaded before you need to press a specific button for it to get the next set of 1,000 or 500, whatever that number is. Uh, let's go ahead and close that screen and that screen. Okay. So, um, Let's see what's, okay, that's fine. Let's go back into the setup and the configuration. And so at this point, we have the, uh, the, the, the full section up here covered. Now on the bottom section, you have a place where you're able to do a toolbar. Uh, in the toolbar, there are two buttons to get you to the URLs or websites that are of convenience for you or important to you. Uh, you can put them directly here if you want to. Uh, and then effectively in this case, You'll notice those are sitting up here. You see this first one is the, the one that says web search. It has a search uh, global icon. And the next one on the top left corner is a regular URL. So if you click apply, click OK, you're able to click on this button. We basically told it to go to Google. You click on the other button, and we effectively told it to go to results. Um, give me just one second up here. Let's go ahead and... Uh, take this down. And I'm going to have a browser open for you so we're able to uh, see the effect of those screens. So if we have, I think I have Chrome on the system. Yes, I do. All right. So uh, effectively what we're saying is that you can come into this button and you highlight it and it will open up for you in this case because we programmed Google this URL. 
in the first button, and the other one, I think we, uh, yeah, we had results software, which now goes to Abacus Next results here. You can put anything you want, including sub pages over there. Uh, so anything you cut and paste from a browser, you put up here, and it will only again impact the current user. So you put them there as long as you want them to be able to think about 100 characters long, and that will open up automatically. The final one on the on the general and the most the commonly used one is the in the startup options is telling the system which modules you use in a regular enough basis that as soon as you get into results you want the system to open those for you. So the typical, what we see out there is the to-do board, most important, right? Some people like the dashboard, some people like the home page, some people use them both. Um, and then the calendar, if you're calendar heavy and you don't, uh, remember the, until the calendar is open, your alarms don't, don't work with, with um, Outlook, for example, if uh, you have an appointment schedule, but your Outlook did not open, then there's nothing to remind you of that appointment because the system is not live for it to recognize that there's an appointment coming. So it's the same issue. For those that use calendar heavily, especially alarms, you would want that calendar checkbox open. So let's see what that behaves like. In this case, I selected three. Um, and then let's see what happens when I come back into the system. So I'm going to exit from here. And we're going to go to this one which is version 18. And now, uh, when I come into the system, I don't have to, um, I'm not clicking on anything by myself. If the system takes care of opening, in this case, the calendar, separate tab for the dashboard, separate tab for the to-do board, and the system is ready to go. So it's just a significant amount of savings, uh, by uh, time savings, by having the system do what it's able to do on my behalf if I wanted to. So this is everything on this tab. That there are these are going to be much more rapid. Uh, there's a lot of around the general configuration to to get you set up. All right, let's get into the contacts. So these are generally contact. Uh, um, it will refer to the contact management system. So one of the first ones, and by default, these are checked, all of them. Um, and by default, this is usually company. And now this is a, a sample data, so I have moved things around, but this is how it's typically set up. So let's go through that. What basically the first one says is that as soon as you add a new record, it's assigned to you. If you don't use assigned to, or you typically set up the records or enter data on behalf of some other team members for your organization, then you might not want to have that checked. Otherwise, this makes sense and your name will go into the assigned to. This one says that the zip code is only going to be validated for the US. So if you put an actual country name in there, then the, the system will disable zip code validation which is built into the system based on the uh, postal code uh, lookup table is built into results. The last one is display an error message when all numeric is not found in the lookup table um, is by default also to be true. The system, like for example, let's say you're adding a UK uh, zip code. That's not all numbers. It's usually a uh, number letter, number letter with a hyphen in the middle. Same thing with the UK and most other countries might not even have a zip code. Uh, this is basically saying if the if all digits entered in there are digital, but even if you had put in the country code, because some people like to put USA uh, or United States in the country, and that will end up devalidating or, or stopping the validation, you might end up overriding it here by basically saying if it's all numeric, validate it anyway. It doesn't matter whether the country has something or not. The final one is says the display name itself. What should it be made out of? And there's a drop-down that allows you to choose different things that are applicable to your company. Most companies that use with company or deal with companies uh, will use the company field as the primary way to sort the records and to identify the record. If you are more dealing with the residential entities, let's say your grassroots organizations and your members or just individuals or family members, then you would go with last name, comma, first name. Uh, so, and the last one, uh, last two items is whether you want us to remind you if you ever create or update, try to hit a save on a record that has a blank source or a blank territory, you can check those boxes to make them required. Effectively, we will prevent you from being able to save a record unless the source and or the territory based on which ones are checked have already been fulfilled. So let me do a quick check for you on this and show you what we're talking about. Let's say you go up here, you add a new contact record. Right now, we have the default to use the assigned to, 
And so if you go and look for internal information up here, you'll notice that I'm user Mary, by the way. Remember on top of the screen, I'm logged in as Mary. And so this is automatically assigned to user Mary. Uh, zip code will be validated when I'm doing a physical address, so when I'm entering the zip code field. If I had checked the box that source is required, um, and right now, notice only contact type is required. That's why we have a red asterisk next to it. But if we made source required, then the system will not let you hit save here unless you've specified the source from the drop down list. That's what we're talking about. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, next one is activities or activity centric. Uh, so it deals with maintaining and managing activities. Instead of you having to go and select the same activity type each time, what we typically recommend is that you would pick the most commonly used one from this drop down. So let's say, for example, you are in client services. Most of your work is to call and follow up with clients. So you might want to have a call as your most common activity. And if it's different, then you can go change it and override it. But as long as you have it like that, then and say 80% of the time it's correct, then 80% of the time you saved yourself the trouble from having to specify the default activity type. That's what that's about. Same thing with mail merge letter. When you do a mail merge, the system will allow you to pick the activity type uh, that you would want to specify for tracking that kind of an activity. When you modify an activity for somebody else that's assigned to somebody else, right now I'm logged in as Mary. If I go to Dimitri's activity or take an activity and assign it to Dimitri or go to an existing activity assigned to Dimitri and change the date or time on it, the system I, will give me the option that I can be prompted as to whether I want to notify Dimitri in this case because we just changed something for him while he was not looking. So these are your kind of uh, options. Right, right, right now, I've turned that off. Most of the time, I believe the default, um, I believe it's ask if. So effectively, a message comes up and say, do you want to notify Dimitri that you just messed with his records? So effectively, it's just giving you that kind of uh, ability. The system is also able to uh, report and identify conflicts. So let's say, for example, I'm scheduled from 10 to 12 tomorrow, and I try to go and add a meeting for myself at 11. Well, the system, if I have this checked, the system will basically say before, when I'm hitting the save, saying, are you sure you want to save this? You already have a conflict on the calendar. That's what we're talking about. And then this one says, even when you tell them there's a conflict, there's two modes of operation. You can basically uncheck this for a more um, strict approach that says, no, you're not going to be able to save it. There's a conflict. And until you, you put it on a time where there's no other conflicting appointment, we're not going to let you save it. Most of the time, this is a little bit too harsh. Uh, humans know what they're doing. Most of the time, uh, we do. And so the idea there is to allow that save to happen. But the question is whether you're going to report the uh, conflict or not. The next one deals with the calendar. As, you, as I said before, <laughs> these go rapid because there's not a lot of um, there are specific options, but they're generally focused on what we have been asked to control or manage. Um, so your calendar is controlled by you, and you can specify at what time your start of the day is. So you are able to pick from here the time where you want the calendar to start at uh, for you to show the beginning of your day. And so you can move that around based on the reality of when you really come to the office or when you really would start scheduling appointments. You might have appointments before you come to the office. You might be uh, an early starter like myself. I'm at the start at 4 a.m. So your, the calendar will structure based on what works for you within your environment, and that allows you to just have the calendar not start at 12 a.m. and you have to scroll all the time to get to your data. The other thing is this is the window of time of how much of a time slot will appear on your calendar. And so you can change it with uh, 60, 30, or 15. The default is 15, by the way. Most people will change that to 30. So whatever works for you, structure it here, and the system will then set it up properly for you. The update all open activity, this is an ability for, this takes a little bit more work for the system behind the scenes, but effectively, um, if you, let's say you have more than one calendar open, and yes, in results, you can actually open up multiple calendars. 
at the same time. And so what this is going to allow you to do is to basically be able to have, if you change a record or an activity, it doesn't just update the existing calendar that's open, but it goes to all the other calendars that might be open and also change them at the same time. Typically, when you want to open more than one calendar, let's say on this calendar, you're dealing with those people, and then you go and, uh, let's say, bring in the dashboard. Now you can go and, as long as you're not on the calendar itself, if you click on another calendar, it will open an additional calendar. Maybe in this one you want to see departmental. Uh, for this department, I want to see what they're doing, and I want to see it on a weekly basis. So you still have the original, you still have the change. What we're saying with that setting is that if you make a change up here, maybe it also affects the display on this calendar based on which day is being displayed. This will take its time, the time to go and update every single open calendar to make sure the visual representation of the data is displayed properly. Your next one is deals with email settings, and this is whether you're using Outlook or not, and whether you're using the 32-bit version of Outlook or 64-bit version, you will choose one of the two. You also can choose as to whether you want the system to remind you to add a, a activity record uh, when you're setting up uh, to, to remind you that an a email was sent from the system. There's also a ability for you to use your internal email form versus going directly to Outlook when you tell the system I'm going to send an email and you push put your cursor on a contact record and you press the email button. So it can open up quick for Outlook directly or it can open up for you the internal form. By default we use the internal form. And there's a number of things that are settings that you are able to override if you want to as to whether uh, if, especially if you're using Outlook, right? So you can automatically have your emails uh, request a mail receipt or a read receipt as well as a delivery receipt. You're also able to have additional settings on the internal form automatically checked off if you want to force the system to save a message with your email, for example, and other settings like that. So you can check them. By default, we only do the first one. And the final two is the default activity types that you would want to designate or have the system designate when it's adding activities on its own to capture emails coming in from Outlook or send directly in the system. The email too is a place where you're able to, if you want to create a signature block and such, you use a file up here, you check that box. Um, and this is whether you want to mail merge letters to not have any formatting versus being, you know, plain text versus the formatted text. And you also can decide whether you want to use HTML or plain text for the signature block. The next set of options deal with configuring your project uh, codes themselves. When you add a project, we're able to automatically issue a project code. Uh, this helps you track how your projects are set, or in this case, your defaults are uh, using the first the two digits of a year. In this case, we're 18, month is 09, and DD would be 20 in the, as of today, for example. And then the SEQ3 means that you are going to have the system worry about creating a sequential number for you starting at 001 all the way to dash 999. So effectively, with this system, you're able to create up to 999 unique projects a day uh, because you have the DD being a unique number. If that's not enough, then come in here and change it to a 4. If that's too much, then change it to a 2. Right, so it's just a, it's an ability for you to control the, the numbering system, and we have a, a kind of a chart for you down here to help you, to help guide you through that decision. What you're also able to do when you're creating a brand new project or sales opportunities, and again, this is per user. So let's say you're in a department that deals with upsell. So you might want to change that to upsell because more likely that's the type of project you're setting up. You can set up uh, this specialized or, or, or default uh, status, the default stage, based on the type of work you do within the company. This would be the sales opportunity default. So this is what a typical sale is. Let's say I'm working on upsells. And then I deal with uh, different settings uh, for the status as needed and the stage that I typically start at. This allows to minimize the, uh, allows me to minimize the number of data entry and the you know uh, the clicks that I have to make to get the stuff going when I'm adding a brand new record. 
The next one is deals with the timesheet module, similar to the way we set up the calendar as to what time we want to start. This is a way for you to start the timesheet module as what time you, the office in general, has time. That doesn't mean you can't get to the 8 a.m. and the 7 a.m. if there are some, but you would scroll up to get them. The question is, what is what time slot do we start at to give you the maximum visibility into the most common data, uh, for common data for your office? Also, there's a checkbox in our calendar that says all day activities. Uh, you check it and it basically puts the time on the top of the calendar instead of us mark it within the window of time on the calendar itself. The important thing there, though, is that you can, we need to calculate the duration for you uh, based on how we're going to, how many hours we put on the timesheet. And this specifies that in my case, uh, my day is an eight hour day. Maybe it is a 12 hour day. Maybe it's a 10 hour day or nine hour. The typical is eight and you can overwrite it as needed. The next setting, and this is really the final one that has real uh, importance. Uh, the others are more internal or a one-time setup. So this is an ability for you to configure the header of your reports. Your, and your forms, invoice forms, codes, et cetera. So if you want to use those, you can check that box, and by default it's checked. We get this address information from your license file. This is the license issued under your name and company. Uh, so that's where we read the data from, but you can update it, and this can be up to 12 characters. No, I had the phone number listed twice, so I'm going to go ahead and remove it from here. But maybe I want to put a website at the, at the bottom of this. I also have two lines for a message in the footer. Let's say we have a promotional thing coming up, we can also basically put those within the two-line footer message at the bottom of my forms and reports. Uh, if I'm emailing invoices or codes, this would be the uh, section that will go by default, the text that will go by default into uh, the letter itself. So again, this is per person. So let's say you want to have, um, you know, James, Smith is the uh, there, and they can put the extension one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, and extension 302. Um, and the idea there is then this becomes part of the, 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 the default um, email that will be built and sent along with the attached to an invoice. Uh, and so the or the email address and the phone number of James Smith in this example will be also included there. You do the same thing for quotations. You do the same thing for service orders. So on the purchase orders, uh, you also uh, can have the choice to default the price uh, on the product to be the cost from the accounting because that's typically, if that's what the cost is, that's typically what you paid for it last time. So when you're creating a PO to your vendor, then this is more likely going to be the more accurate number. If there was a change, it can be adjusted, but the idea is that uh, it allows you to pick between the two most common numbers to be used in PO creation. The top portion up here is an ability for you to set the defaults for what it is like when you're setting up brand new users. So if you're in your area, your tax rate is 7.65, then you can have it there. And from that point, every time you add a new record, by default, it will have the tax rate. So also by default, have the so you put a net 10 as a default, that will have the net 10 as a default. So this is your, uh, one more down here. This is an ability for you when you're doing a rapid ad uh, to, to use the grid or the tree based on what's applicable to you. These are two settings and how data is captured and entered when you're adding invoices, quotations, sales orders, etc. So the default is tree and that's usually is the best. The final one is that within the grid area, if you use the grid uh, by default or move to it from within the system, you're able to decide when you're searching for text within those columns, which one is most applicable. This one, as I mentioned, uh, this is more set up typically at the uh, time when you do the onboarding for your, the administrative onboarding session for your organization. It effectively allows you to decide if you're using Smart Vault, then these are the settings. If you're using a product called Constant Contact, typically keep in mind, again, you've got to license those, but you let us know for, for the license to use those as integrations. There's Shale File, there's QuickBooks uh, Payments, so it used to be Merchant Services, or called Merchant Services, there's your T sheets integration. So um, most of the time they're already set. You don't typically mess with those. There's not much to change there. It's just a confirming that they've already been set up and the integration is in place. 
The DB Connect says for database connection, most of the time you're not able to, to or have no need to come in here. By the way, this password will only appear if you're an administrator. That basically means you already know the password. And so, or you already have the password. So we're showing it here for convenience. But if you're not an administrator, this would be nothing but asterisks up here. It's also a similar situation for allowing you to encrypt the contents of the no, uh, results ionized so that nobody can open up that text file in Notepad and see what's going on. The final one up here is, um, again, informational. This is already set up by your deploying entities who have installed the software for you and configured it for immediate use would typically have this as an R drive or a server name. It's basically where your files are located. If you're curious as to where your attachments, which are your images and files and folders uh, are stored, then that's really the location where they get started. And that's what you have to back up on a regular basis to capture every document within that folder and subfolder structure that you might have used within the system. All right, I think we are, that's it for today. This is the, your configuration options. Uh, module itself. If you have further questions, please reach us at the uh, email support up here from within your help menu that will allow us to receive automatically your licensing information so we know who we're doing business with or who we're talking to, and then just type in your question and send it in. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Um, thank you for having so many. It's exciting to have so many of you on the line and uh, attending those regular uh, free Thursday training on such a regular basis. So appreciate your time. Have a great afternoon. This video recording will be converted and added to the uh, webinar section on our main website. It's under resources from the main results uh, CRM uh, website on, uh, on, at abacuslex.com. Thank you, everyone.